the summary of the day's proceeding is by uh, Professor Harvey Brown um, of Oxford University, and um, I hand over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Ashbourn for the invitation to the impossible today, and that's to say sum up this, this wonderful set of talks. Um, I'm sure that you all agree with me that this has been a feast of quantum concepts. Let me start with, of course, with Jim Baggett and his talk. I was very pleased that Jim started with his, a, a historical section where he distinguished between Einstein's contribution to the theory of light as opposed to the quantum revolution that was started supposedly by Planck. Planck is often regarded as the father of quantum mechanics. But as, as Jim Baggett pointed out, it was Einstein who first realized that the quantum nature of light, independent of how it's produced and absorbed, is the, it's the quantum nature of light that was important. Light itself has a wave particle dualism, and that's the beginning of the whole story in the history of quantum mechanics about wave particle dualism. That was due to Einstein. Now, coming to the essential mystery of quantum mechanics, I have been struggling myself professionally with the foundations of quantum mechanics for well over 40 years. I have not heard a better introduction to the mis essential mystery of quantum mechanics than we heard this morning through Jim Baggett's talk. What I would like to do is to just make some very quick remarks on the distinction he raised between Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla being the instrumentalist approach to quantum mechanics and Charybdis being one involving some notions of quantum reality. It's so important that we consider this distinction and take it seriously. Which way are we supposed to go? Now, Bohr himself, Niels Bohr, who Jim Bagger pointed out was one of the key, the key um, developers or articulators, if you like, of the Copenhagen interpretation. Bohr, of course, was extremely famous and widely admired for his original quantum theory of the atom. This was before we fully understood wave functions and the Schrodinger equation and all the rest of it. But Bohr did something that everyone regarded as completely miraculous. He introduced a completely incoherent theory which described for the first time quantitatively the structure of the hydrogen atom and the way that it's radiated and absorbed um, radiation and so on. So he was a, a, a giant, almost magical figure in the field at the time, hugely influential through, the Copen, through his Copenhagen Institute. And Jim made a very nice point of saying that he had a terrible struggle with words. He tried so hard to articulate his theory of complementarity. And sometimes I say to my students, a good idea should be robust under language. It shouldn't depend too much on exactly the way you say it. Now, I can't help, I can't refrain from mentioning a particular episode. Tony Sudbury mentioned a wonderful collection of essays, reprinted essays and papers on the foundations of quantum mechanics that was edited by Wheeler and Zurich in 1982 or 3, I think. In this collection of essays, they reprinted Bohr's famous reply to the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen argument, which was claiming, trying to show that the standard interpretation, the, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is incomplete. Now, this original paper was published by Bohr in Physical Review, famous journal in physics, and when it was reproduced in the volume, two of the pages were accidentally interchanged. <laughs> and miraculously, grammatically, it worked. <laughs> and it took many of us, who've spent a great deal of our lives, probably too much, trying to understand Bohr's writings and reading his writings, it took us a long time to realize this mistake was made. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, let me, let me say a little bit about Einstein. What was Einstein's point here? Einstein said that realism was a program. He, he talked about being religious, but it was a dogma about which he was not dogmatic. Einstein's point was, of course we have a subjective element in our scientific thinking. We start by trying to understand the world that's created by our perceptions, and we try to establish some order amongst those perceptions. Of course, there's a subjective element. But there's an objective element in science. We create models that try to make sense of all that sense data on the basis of postulation of mind-independent things. Mind-independent things. Now, we may be successful, we may not be. 
But that's the task of the physicist as we understand it now. That's the task of the physicist. Now, of course, this can give rise to what Jim said called wild, unconstrained, metaphysical nonsense about reality. But not, let's not give up hope. We have at the moment a number of interpretations of quantum mechanics that deal specifically with realist interpretations of the wave function or some aspects of quantum reality. And I don't know, I think it's far too early myself to take the despairing notion that we must fall back on some kind of instrumentalist picture of quantum reality which provides predictions but no explanation. Now I'd like to pass on to Tony Sudbury's talk, which I found an illuminating analysis of the pro pro progression of Schrodinger's ideas between 1935 and, and 1955. Of course, 1935 was the year of the publication of the einstein podolsky rosen paper. Incidentally, amongst all of Einstein's writings, the most cited paper. Very little cited for quite a long period of time. And the extent to which Schrodinger was really a precursor in many ways to the Everett interpretation of 1957. Actually, I find it rather sad that in 1957, this, this occurred, 1957 was the year that Everett published his, his famous paper, two years after Einstein's death. This was the first interpretation of quantum mechanics that satisfied three criteria that Einstein always demanded. Realism, determinism, and locality. And I'll come back to say a word about locality in a moment. Now, Tony was raising the idea that the superposition principle really is an and, and not an or. And that and means that when we do experiments involving superposed systems, and that superposition principle infects itself into the, into the descriptions of the apparatuses and us looking at the apparatuses, that we're really looking at not us in a superposition of states. What we're really talking about is a superposition of us's. That's what we're really, that's what Everett's insight. This is not a superposition, it's, this is not a state of a cat that's in a superposition and dead and alive. Once we understand the role of decoherence, what this really means is it is a pluralistic, it is a superposition of different cats, one alive and one dead. Now the question arises, how seriously to take this? You have to swallow hard to, to follow Everett. You have to swallow very hard. This is a tremendous multiplicity of worlds suddenly opening up before you. And Tony Sudbury raised the interesting question as to degrees of reality. Now, from a God's eye point of view, you see these experiments taking place in different branches of the universe, and these branches themselves branching as a result of the superposition principle, producing these decoherent worlds within a universe, a single universe. Now, Tony regards that as a kind of a pale notion of reality, because ultimate reality has to do with us. And Tony wants to put the subject back into physics. And he's not alone here. There's another very recent interpretation of quantum mechanics, very, very different in style, called cubism, which is a cute shortage of, a short version of quantum Bayesianism, which likewise claims that quantum mechanics is forcing us to do something that for 2,000 years we've been neglecting, and that is to put the self or the subject back into physics. My own view about this, I'm a little bit skeptical because I always think of what Bell called the great enterprise. The great enterprise is to explain the world. Or as Einstein would say, to look at those elements in the theory that are mind independent. And I wonder what it is we're supposed to say about the early universe, which was evolving through quantum state evolution, when there were no, in the early universe, there were simply no conscious agents. What was happening? Surely it wasn't just pale. So I'm just going to leave that comment there. I was so happy when, when Tony mentioned a fork in the road of Schrodinger's thinking. Because the best one-line description of quantum mechanics I've ever come across was Judy Yogi Berra. 
Some of you will know about Yogi Berra, great baseball player famous for his aphorisms. By the way, I'm reminded very much of Trump because Yogi Berra at one stage says, I didn't say all the things I said. <laughs> Yogi Berra, <laughs> Yogi Berra's one-line aphorism, which is perfect for ever-reading quantum mechanics, is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> now, Lena Janssen's talk. I thought this was a very interesting analysis of Newton's understanding of the non-local feature of his own theory of gravity. We need analyses like this. Because Newton was not only a revolutionary physicist, he was also inventing scientific methodology as he went along. Scientific methodology that has had a huge impact on the subsequent history of physics. And of course, the issue of action at a distance, the, the non-local nature of the gravitational interaction in his theory is very puzzling. It certainly puzzled Newton, and he worked very hard unsuccessfully to find some kind of ether-theoretic account of that interaction. But nonetheless, as Lena has pointed out, there is something explanatory about it. And when, uh, when Newton himself says it's inconceivable that two bodies can act on each other at a distance without some kind of mediating body through, through a vacuum, it's funny how we get used to it. What's inconceivable at one stage becomes almost natural. When Maxwell introduced a local theory of electrodynamics in the 19th century, on the continent that had been so antagonistic to action at a distance, some people found it so strange that they turned it back into an action at a distance version. So it's funny how we get used to things that seem at first sight inconceivable. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, what about Einstein's, what about Einstein's um, commitment to locality? Einstein said, it's got to be the case that something happening over here is not going to be influenced by something that's happening at a distance. Why? Because otherwise physics would be impossible. How can I set up initial conditions in the laboratory? And I want to repeat those initial conditions to see if I'm getting the same results, to see patterns and laws playing themselves out. If what I'm doing in the laboratory depends, for example, on the positions of all the electrons in the moon, how's that supposed to work? But there's something funny in quantum mechanics, which is that in quantum mechanics, there's a no-signaling theorem, which means that whatever you do, even if you've got entangled systems, whatever you measure this side, the probabilities are not going to depend on what you're doing to the other element in the entangled pair. Now, this is entanglement is sometimes referred to as a kind of non-separability. It doesn't necessarily involve non-locality. It's a kind of non-separability. What, what it means is you can know everything there is to know about this system. You can know everything there is to know about that system. But that doesn't tell you everything you know about the joint system. So Einstein, in a sense, in a sense was wrong about this. You can do physics as long as you have this strange kind of quantum mechanical non-separability. But now the question arises, is that action at a distance? Well, you'll, you'll remember the einstein podolsky rosen paper tried to show that if quantum mechanics is complete, these strange, intera these strange correlations between systems, in quantum mechanics between entangled systems, they're going to make it look as if, I mean, because you do a measurement here and you determine something that wasn't actually fixed, this is a random outcome, you, and then you know immediately what you're going to get on the distance system, what was originally random and unknown must suddenly become fixed at a distance, and this looks like action at a distance. So Einstein said, OK, well, let's treat the wave function as incomplete. It's just a statistical representation of our ignorance of the precise goings on. So Einstein believed in a hidden variable theory. And then Bell, of course, in the 1960s, showed that even if you accept that view, you're still committed to non-locality. So it's starting to look, at first sight, as if non-locality, action at a distance, it permeates quantum mechanics. But there's one exception. Oh, and by the way, before I say what that exception is, there's a very important distinction between Newtonian action at a distance and quantum mechanical action at a distance insofar as it exists. And that's the following. And I'm, this is something I'm sure that Lena didn't mention for time constraints. Einstein said you can't have things acting at a distance with each other. But what about Newtonian gravity? Why isn't that a counterexample? 
It's not a counterexample because gravity falls off with distance. You can screen it, at least to some extent. So the electrons on the moon may have a gravitational effect on you right now, but it's tiny. It's negligible. In quantum mechanics, if there is action at a distance due to entanglement, it does not fall off with distance. That's the big difference. It does not fall off with distance. These particles can be as far away as you like, and that entanglement will still be as strong as you like, in principle. So it's the no-signaling theorem that in some sense saves the day. <clears throat> what is the exception? Everett again. Everett is the only interpretation of quantum mechanics where the EPR argument fails, and because there are no hidden variables in the theory, so does the Bell theorem. It becomes irrelevant. So there is one exception. It's not true to say that quantum mechanics across the board is non-local, has action at a distance. The Everett theory does not. To show this takes a bit of doing. Now finally, to, well, to Richard David, who pointed out that in the Everett interpretation, probability really is the key conceptual conundrum. And I think this is absolutely right. A lot of people balk at the Everett picture because it's so... I mean, as realism is, is just... Is the, the, you know, the prolific number of worlds that are happening all the time just seems absolutely unbelievable. But I think we have to remind ourselves again, Newton thought that action at a distance was inconceivable. It later became convention. What about Copernicus? Copernicus, who believed that the Earth was in motion, that doesn't really mean very much because motion is purely relative. Who cares whether it's, you put your coordinate system on the Sun with respect to which the Earth is moving or whether you put your coordinate system on the Earth with respect to which the Sun is moving? Who cares? The real point was, if the Earth is moving around the Sun, if it's moving with respect to the stars, then in the course of a year we should see stellar parallax. We should see the stars moving amongst themselves. In the same way that when you drive past a forest, you see the position of trees move amongst themselves. We don't see it. Well, what was the obvious explanation? The universe is vast. The stars are huge, at a huge distance from us. That must have been inconceivable initially, but we got used to it. So whatever it is saying is, Copernicus was right, but the world is even bigger. Maybe we should get used to it. Maybe not. However, the issue of probability, and here, this really is difficult. We face two problems. What does it mean to talk about probabilities for events for when everything that can happen does happen? according to quantum mechanics. What does that even mean? How can I bet more on one outcome rather than another when they both are going to happen? What does that mean? That's the so-called incoherence problem. And then there's the question that Richard addressed himself to in more detail about once you get over that hurdle and you can somehow tell yourself that it's rational to bet in some way, even though you have this strange ontology, this strange multiplicity of worlds, then the question is, what probabilities do you assign? Now, in general, you're going to make a terrible mistake if you assign equal probabilities. And here, there's a lot of debate. And Richard mentioned the deutsch wallis theorem, and then the Sebens and Carroll um, argument. In relation to the latter, I, I, I don't, there's a lot I could say here, but just in relation to the latter, um, the idea of... Um, there's a kind of an epistemic condition that you mentioned, Richard, which essentially is related to something like the, the, the probabilities that I'm looking at right now will not depend in an, in a, in an alarming way on the, on the nature of the environment. This reminds me a lot of the no signaling theorem. And we've known for a long time, particularly through the very early work of George Svetlichny, that in quantum mechanics, if you start with the claim that there's a no signaling theorem, you can then derive the Born rule. So I think it's, it's a modern version of this old argument. But the problem is, the problem with this is we know that there are going to be branches in Everett where the Born rule fails. We know that. What are the agents in those branches insofar as they can even exist? What are they going to say? Are they going to buy this argument? If the Born rule fails, there could be actions at a distance occurring through entanglement. So what are they going to say in this case? I'm not sure that they're going to buy the the assumptions of the Sevens, Carol. 
At any rate, at the very end of your, of your talk, you raised this very interesting question about are we looking in, in quantum mechanics at a shift in the character of physics? In rather the, the way that when, when Newton was developing his theory, we did see a shift in the way that we thought scientifically. Are we seeing that today? I think that's a fascinating question. I'm skeptical, but I like to think I'm a little bit open-minded about this. But I thought it was a very interesting question. Well, some of you, I wonder if some of you were relieved to descend from the rarefied atmosphere of quantum reality to the no-nonsense arena of quantum technologies. What a wonderful talk. It was fascinating. And I was struck by the fact that the photoelectric effect, lasers, both again bring us back to Einstein. The photoelectric effect, as we saw in the talk, was something he explained for the first time on his light quantum theory of electromagnetism. But lasers themselves depend on a thing called stimulated emission, and that's something that Einstein proposed, I think in 1917. There was a very interesting discussion, of course, of atomic clocks and their accuracy, which is absolutely stupendous. One part in 10 to the 18, the most modern ones. I'd just like to mention a quick episode here. With atomic clocks, you can measure the degree to which the rotation of the Earth fails to be exactly constant. I mean, it was the best clock we had in the 19th century. The astronomers used the rotation of the Earth with respect to the stars. But we know that the Earth is a dynamical thing and there are tides Immanuel Kant was the first person who suggested that tides will change the rotation rate of the Earth. His argument wasn't quite right, but it was, the idea was correct. And now we know, for example, I mean, take something like in the Northern Hemisphere, land is rebounding after ice sheets have melted. Well, that changes the, the shape of the Earth, and that's going to change the rate of rotation. The Earth is a dynamical thing. Atomic clocks now are so accurate that when they test for errors in the rotation rate of the Earth, errors with respect to atomic time, they now see a seasonal signal that has to do with the rise of sap in trees. Let me just finally mention, it was fascinating to see the other, a review of the other technologies that are in the near future, but let me just, come, let me just finish very quickly by mentioning the issue of one of the things that, one of the great success stories of quantum mechanics, it wasn't really mentioned very much today, stability of matter. We are all here because atoms are stable entities. And when, for example, we take a glass of water, two glasses of water, and we pour them together, we get nothing more exciting than a doubling of the volume of water with a tiny, tiny, tiny negligible release of energy. Why isn't it stupendous? If you look at the physics, and in, in particular, the nature of the Coulomb interaction between electrons and electrons and nuclei, and nuclei nuclei, it's very, very unclear why, when you mix two equal volumes of water together, you shouldn't get an enormous explosion. It's very unclear. Quantum mechanics explains the, the stability of single atoms essentially because a wave function is like a fluid or a rubber ball. If you squeeze it, it requires an energy, it means an energy cost. I can't tell you exactly why that solves the problem of stability, but it does. The understanding of bulk matter, the stability of bulk matter, really only occurred in the 1960s, through, largely through the work of Freeman Dyson. This was only fully established in the 1960s that matter is stable in, in this important sense of being able to be mixed together and not produce explosions. And that boils down to one single important fact that the many electron wave function inside bulk matter is anti-symmetric. It has a very peculiar property for identical particles it's called anti-symmetry, which means when you permute the particle labels in the wave function, the description of the wave function, you change the sign of the wave function. Who ordered that? How do you understand this if quantum mechanics is mere information? Surely it's telling us there's something real about this object. And there I'll leave it. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you, Harvey, for this beautiful summary. Um, there's uh, some minutes for questions, so if you want to ask questions. Uh, thank you, Harvey. That was great. Um, I have a question about um, quantum entanglement. Yeah. It's not an area I know a great deal about. But as I understand it, you could have particles on one side of the universe and the other side of the universe. And the sheer fact that you, the wave function falls at one and you've only got a down spin, the other one will have, as I understand it, instantaneously an upspin. I can accept that this may not be used for information travel, but I'm in danger of mixing up two theories that don't mix very well, because I also hear that the term simultaneous in relativistic terms is not an absolute term. It's different for different people. So how can two quantum entanglement particles have an yeah. instantaneous effect when that... Yeah, that's a very, very good question. If you think of the wave function as being something real, and, it, and the quantum description is complete, so for example, you take the, the the fundamental assumptions of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935. They're the same as the Copenhagen interpretation. Then what you do over here is going to collapse the wave function over there. In the case of an entangled state with measurements occurring here. That is an action at a distance. As you say, it picks out a privileged simultaneity relation. That is hopelessly inconsistent with special relativity. You cannot... There's, there's no way of reconciling that in any, any satisfactory way with Einstein's pr uh, special theory of relativity. So you're dead right. Okay. Step in Everett. Step in any theory that doesn't have a collapse mechanism. De broglie bohm pilot wave theory and Everett. There, there's no collapse. So it's not so clear now exactly if there is any kind of fundamental... Well, in the case of de broglie bohm at the level of the hidden variables in this theory, these hypothetical particles that trace out definite positions and so on in space, they do talk to each other at a distance. Yeah. So they pick out a privilege frame also. That's inconsistent with special relativity, but now there's a subtlety. You don't control these things. You don't see them at the phenomenological level. At the phenomenological level, you've got the no-signaling theorem. So now, is this inconsistent with special relativity? Well, it depends on how you define special relativity. Does it apply all the way down to the hidden variables? Debatable. So there's, there's various views on this, but you're absolutely right. If the, if the collapse of the wave function is a real process, it's inconsistent with special relativity. Thank you. Prima facie. Yeah. Um, I'm down here. Hello. Could you just say something more about non-separability? Right. That concept. Right. If you think, for example, <coughs> if you think you've got two systems that are entangled and they move apart, say, it doesn't matter how far. There's a wave function that describes the joint system. Okay? It is not a product of a wave function for that system and a wave function for that system. Okay? They don't have wave functions anymore. This is a point that Tony made. They, they've lost their quantum states in some, in some sense. They're not what physicists call pure states anymore. Of course, you can describe them, you can describe an object to them that once you know what that mathematical object, you can predict all of the probabilities for any kinds of measurements you do there. That's called the reduced density matrix. Okay? So if I take the reduced density matrix here and I take the reduced density matrix here, it gives me all the information I need to know about future experiments on these two systems. But it loses sight of possible correlations between the two systems. And that information is in the original entangled wave function. Well, it just means the following, that this system and this system are describing their states as only part of the story. I need to have the tot totality to get the full picture. <coughs> so in a sense, these systems are non-separable. The total description is a kind of a holistic thing. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts, another way of putting it. Yeah, you can't get the information just by looking locally. You're going, you're, there's going to be a loss of information just by looking at local events, as it were. You have to have this more global, holistic picture. That's non-separability. Now, the interesting question in quantum mechanics is, does it necessarily mean some kind of action at a distance? And this is debatable. Okay, so um, I know there are still plenty of questions, but we have to be out of this room at five sharp. So I would like to close it at this point. Sorry for... But I guess we, we will not be able to resolve you know, the question of quantum mechanics. <laughs>
today. So I would like to thank all the speakers of today again. Um, and I would also like to thank all of you for the interest, uh, for your interest in this, uh, um, you know, very fascinating, I think, important topic. So, thank you very much.